This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. I'm your host, Loras, and today we are going to be discussing the 2019 Safdie Brothers film, Uncut Gems. How you doing, Holly? How's it going? How's it going? Good Good Pesach, Holly. All right, Larry, you're a Jew again. Welcome back. I made a crazy risk to gamble. And it's about to pay off. So I want the Celtics to cover. I want the Celtics halftime. I want Garnett points and rebounds. What do you know? I don't know. I just know. Well, I'll tell you what I know. That's the dumbest fucking bet I ever heard of. I disagree. I disagree, Gary. What is that? I started it. Are you serious? You're taking my money all over town, placing bets. I'm having very serious second thoughts. Are you serious right now? I know I fucked up. Howard, where's the money right now? Howard, got my money? Howard! Howard! Is it too late? I'm done. That means nothing. It meant nothing. Please. Give me another shot. I just caught the premiere of Sunday Night in Boston at the brand new Arc Light theater. Adam Sandler, the Safdie brothers, and Kevin Garnett were in person to present the film, and it was quite the time. Adam Sandler is a lot smaller in person than you would expect, so this is going to be an episode that's not going to hit iTunes probably until next week. This is going to be strictly for YouTube, for Gumroad, and for Patreon for the time being, just because it is Tuesday and the Fanatic episode hit iTunes today, so uh, the rest of you may be ahead of the curve, so to speak. Within the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be going dark online. And what I mean by that is uh, I'm going to go through that uh, that Garth Brooks-style phase. What was his alter ego, where he adopted a, a look that seemed to be inspired by the crow? Uh, uh, Waylon Jennings or something like that? I don't know. He, you know, he, he took on this new persona. Uh, no, I am going to be going, ideally, offline as much as I can. I'm not going to be uploading for a little bit, at least throughout the month of January, because I am going to be starting principal photography on what will be my first feature film. So, in order for me to concentrate on that, I am not going to be able to concentrate on the thousand other spinning plates that I have going on between all the videos and whatnot, but... I have been filming and editing shows in the meantime. And so, when that time comes, I will ideally be able to have a proper release schedule that will be met. A lot of the videos have already been released onto Gumroad. I do have new Gumroad audio and video library, so here, here's the deal. If you want to help support this show, and let me tell you, it has been a, a rough week and a half for everybody involved in Headshot LLC. Uh, particularly myself, Hans, and Kenny. So any kind of support is more than welcome, especially during this time. And uh, maybe I'll get into that on a, on a video that will be released through here. I think we're going to be working on something for Glue Addict, which is a reality television program, I like to call it. So uh, I do have a, a two different uh, libraries up and running. We have the, the Low Res Premium Library, which is $3 a month, and it gets you every single... Uh, te- I want to say television, but every single series, visual series that we have produced for the internet, myself and my gang, my collective. And that includes Glue Attic, Comfort Systems, LP Japan, Let's Play with Low Res, E2 Hans, Tom Bien, the, the short-lived live streaming program that Hans was the host of, and I was the co-host of. All of that is available there. It's going to be there forever. And perhaps best of all, you can download it in its original format, which means it is completely uncompressed, and you are getting the the best quality that has been publicly released of that. Now, I also have the the Lores audio library, which I'm going to be posting episodes of the podcast to uh, typically a week or so early there, as well as all bonus episodes. The thing about Gumroad is it's very good for cataloging. And this, this is really what I don't like about Patreon. Patreon, you put up a post and then it just gets lost. It disappears 
into uh, several other posts that you have put up over the, the couple of months that you've had your account. I don't like that. It's, it makes it difficult to find additional content. You know, yeah, you can narrow it down. You can click the audio tab, whatever. That still sucks. I, I, I'm not a fan of that. Gumroad, everything is neat. It's uh, organized. You can find it very easily so long as everything is labeled properly. And trust me, everything is labeled properly. The libraries are worth $3 a piece. Alternatively, if you want access to both and you want to save a buck, you can sign up on patreon.com slash lowres and you will be given immediately a link that will get you into those two libraries for free. Okay? And that, that, that's, that's always good. So that's what we're going to be doing. And the funds for this are going to be uh, being poured into this operation, maintaining that everything is released at a steady rate while I am away working on the film. And when I come back, it'll be picking up like nothing even happened. Okay? So let's talk about this movie, Uncut Gems, which was probably the film that I was looking forward to most at the start of the year. Uh, I think that in retrospect, it's not going to be my top film of the year. It's definitely in the top 10. And I'm going to be getting into the analysis here of this movie. At the, at, the, at the start of the year, I had reached a point of major comic book fatigue. I had went to go see Infinity War last year. And it, it met my worst of expectations. It, it really couldn't have delivered a more terrible product to me personally, which was, again, big budget television series. So even when it came to Joker, you know, we're talking about Joker as a different entity entirely from the comic book sphere, simply because of Joaquin Phoenix having that role, Todd Phillips being the writer and director, and for a while Scorsese was set to produce it. Apparently, he was set to direct it as well for a, a, a roughly four years. They were talking about having him helm that movie. My opinion of what Joker would be was not met. It was surpassed tenfold. Uncut Gems, I don't want to say it didn't meet my expectations because in a lot of ways it did. This is a good movie. I do have some gripes with it. I'm going to get into those gripes. But to be clear, I, I, I can't say that this film is flawed to a degree where you should miss it. If you can catch this movie in the theater, I would highly recommend that. If only because it, 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 you know, it adds something to be able to react to these high intensity moments that the film has plenty of with the rest of the audience. Again, we're, we're, we're going to be discussing this movie and this is a spoiler review. That goes without saying at this point, if you've listened to any episode of this show, just expect me to get into every fine detail of the plot. So the Safdie brothers have become favorites of mine since their 2017 release, Good Time, which I had as the top billing of that year, 2017, as far as the best films went. I thought that movie had managed to capture New York in a brutally authentic manner. And I've talked about this uh, many times before I did the, the video rendition of, uh, of movies where I talked about the Godzilla 98 to Sex in the City to Girls transition that the general portrayal of NYC had gone through from the mid-90s up until the, the early aughts and early 10s or so. They resurrected a style of uh, New York City that is grimy in its approach and its overall texture. And they handle the city with, with uh, both loving hands but also that, that, that 80s and 70s uh, perspective on things. And I mean, really, I've been a lot of places and New York City is one of the worst. New York City is atrocious. People like to go and, act, you know, this is not quite the case right now because I'm pretty sure the crime rate is up. But people are like, oh, yeah, New York City, they clean that up. Clean that up. Clean that up. I mean, maybe they cleaned up a bit of the crime. I'm still seeing homeless people that are that are nuts, that are crazy, that are potentially dangerous. Uh, like at least two to three times a day, just navigating my way to work and back. So, New York City is trash, it's horrible, and uh, I do live here now, so great start to things. When it comes to noteworthy directors, maybe specifically auteurs, they tend to have a batch of starter films that are often ignored, and then they have their first real one that pops off. So, 
For example, with Brian De Palma, that first real film of his was Phantom of the Paradise, even though he had done a collection of movies with Robert De Niro in the late 60s. That weren't, he didn't capture the essence of his style just yet. And Phantom of the Paradise was, was the first peak of that. For Stanley Kubrick, it was The Killing, or arguably Paths of Glory. For Paul Thomas Anderson, it was Boogie Nights. He kind of went right into it. It was just Hard Eight and then Boogie Nights and so on. Uh, you know, the list goes on with these filmmakers. The Safdies had made a batch of critically well-received starter films, all of which thematically shared DNA with their later, glossier films, Good Time and now Uncut Gems. As a film goer, Uncut Gems feels like a continuation of the universe that Good Time had established. The pleasures of being robbed, daddy long legs, and heaven knows what are all phase one, as far as I'm concerned. Those are confined to an uber reality. These films we're discussing, the latter of which, Uncut Gems, I was you know, stoked to be able to, to see this week, <clears throat> exist in a filmic hyper reality. They exist within the logic and sense of a movie, whereas those three earlier films almost strictly obey the laws of our natural reality. Uncut Gems is the closest that the duo have come to touching upon the metaphysical realm. There is a lot of underlying mysticism to this movie that mostly goes unspoken or is discussed through the dialogue surrounding the real centerpiece of the film, this rare Ethiopian opal that has a street value of anywhere between $175,000 to, at least if we're to go off of the word of the protagonist, potentially millions of dollars. Howard Ratner, Adam Sandler's Rich Voss-esque protagonist, gets a hold of this inconveniently sized and shaped stone full of diamonds, and his goal is to pawn it off at a live auction for millions of dollars. This is before Celtic star Kevin Garnett walks into his showroom and takes an immediate interest in the jewel. There's a lot going on in that initial scene, and we're introduced to about four or five different central characters in this story right off the bat. It's a lot of information to absorb at once, and the presentation is a bit sloppy. We're familiar with Ratner. He's the face of the movie. He's on every poster. He's our lead. But then we're supposed to take note of his employee girlfriend, Julia, played by Julia Fox, and her more... Uh, you know, frisky ways with these uh, these these uh, young celebrities. And, uh, you know, also his middleman, Damani, played by Lakeith Stanfield. We also have a hired muscle by the name of Phil sent to wring some money out of Howard, played brilliantly by the 50-something-year-old newcomer Keith Williams Richards. This is his first movie. Imagine that. And then, of course, Kevin Garnett is Kevin Garnett. He's unmissable, and all things considered... He gives a pretty solid performance for a basketball player. I want to compare Uncut Gems and its predecessor, Good Time. The two films that were released earlier this year, Dragged Across Concrete and The Standoff at Sparrow Creek, both released by Cine State. The Standoff at Sparrow Creek was a brief 88 minutes and felt like a warm-up plate to the much richer meal that was Dragged Across Concrete. By comparison, and this isn't a knock-on, the previous Cine State film, the nearly three-hour-long S. Craig Zoller masterpiece, Dragged Across Concrete, had created more of an immersive world. It was full of depth. It was like watching a novel unfold on screen. There is a similar effect here with Uncut Gems and Good Time. Uncut Gems is, is a notable length longer than good time was and for that reason good time feels sharper it feels tighter if the standoff at sparrow creek was a delicious first course good time felt more like having your ice cream sundae before the meal you just had ice cream and yeah you like steak and potatoes but again you just had ice cream uncut gems struggles a little in its takeoff maybe strictly due to that sensory overload and it requires a bit too much from its viewers i will say that but in addition to having a rocky takeoff, the film has a, a shaky landing at best. Everything in between that, though, is magic. It's already been said repeatedly, but this is easily Adam Sandler's best role and performance of his entire career, and it's not even close. You're amused by Howard Ratner. You grow annoyed with Howard Ratner. You start to despise Howard Ratner. 
You feel pity for Howard Ratner. And then by the end of it, you have a full, unmistakable idea of who Howard Ratner is. And that this is a man who can never properly fix himself. He has a self-destructive problem with compulsion. The only way for Howard Ratner to live as a free man is to be stripped of everything he's ever earned and to live broke, dead broke. But because he's deciphered the rhythm to his business and specifically gambling and he's fallen in sync with it, he'll never fully reach that point. He's wealthy, his family is wealthy, his girlfriend living in his upscale apartment is wealthy by proxy. At his core, what he values beyond his friends and family is his financial standing. And the lesson that is learned throughout the movie is, if you keep making reckless big swings that alienate those closest to you and create unmitigated variables that can and will eventually cause significant damage to your life, there's only one way that that can end. And that is how it ends. So there's a moment toward the end of the film. And let me, let me just set this up real quick. Kevin Garnett's character has his own motivations. He wants his hands on this opal from Ethiopia because he believes it is offering him some kind of boost on the court. There's, there's a, a certain magic to it that just makes him perform like no other when he has this in his possession. So uh, at the end of the film, after going through uh, a couple of couple of couple of bumps in the road, he does manage to get the opal. Howard sells it to Kevin Garnett, and he goes and he plays. I think it was like the Spurs. I I, I forget who the Celtics are playing at the at the end of the film, uh, but Kevin Garnett is the showstopper. He wins the game for the Celtics, and he's being interviewed, and he has a line that's something along the lines of. Um, the, the only thing that matters is winning. That's a line he says. And this is overlaid with the cataclysmic result for our protagonist, Howard, which goes directly in the face of that, that how you win is just as important as the victory itself, if not more so. Howard Ratner has built a, a cachet of negativity with all of the parties in his life so that he has proven correct at the end of the film that, that his way is an effective way of furthering yourself and doubling your financial income. But what does that actually matter if you piss off the wrong people? If you make somebody so upset, if you do something like hold somebody in a cage, right, against their will for three to five hours, sweating hot... Is that going to matter? Is there is there a cut of the money that they're going to receive from their boss, from your gain here, going to matter? As opposed to putting a bullet in somebody for thinking that they could do that to you? It's, it's unlikely, you know? So um, let me talk a bit more about the, the acting and the filmmaking before I dig into my issues with this movie. And there are a few issues, but again, I want to state for the record, this is a great film, okay? You know, I, I had a, a listener reach out to me on Instagram that thinks I'm a bit too negative with these films, that I incite hatred onto things that don't matter, quote-unquote, which I don't agree with. I, I think I'm just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm critiquing things as I see fit. And it just so happens that there's a lot of movies with a lot of problems that are being released. Not that that's anything new. Where would we be if we just fawned over movies? We'd be the Collider movie crew, if that was the case. So uh, let me let me talk a bit about the, the technical aspects of this movie. So as I said before, Sandler is excellent as Howard Ratner, but everybody pulls their weight in this movie. Something that I really love about the Safdie brothers, and I've tried to do myself in the past, is incorporating actors who are not actors, who are just faces you would recognize and be familiar with if you lived any kind of uh, textured life in the city. Uh, Lakeith Stanfield, who I find to be very hit or miss, he seems to have that Shia LaBeouf aspect to him where he just tries too hard to be interesting and weird at times, and it doesn't work. It can pull you out of the movie. I'm thinking about Death Note specifically, where he's just like, you know, he's sitting crouched down, on a chair like an anime black guy which i mean maybe for the the context of the movie being death note and him being a black guy makes sense but 
you know what I'm saying. I'm talking more like Naruto. You know, and they get the long trench coat jacket. But he's good here. He's he's very good here. He's not annoying. Uh, he's he, he tones it down quite a bit. And that is exactly what is right for this role of Damani. Adina Menzel is great as Howard's cold bitch Long Island wife, Dina, who, let me be clear here, has every right in the world to be a cold bitch in this film. Her family structure is artificial at best exclusively because of Howard's indulgent nature. She's wonderful in this movie. Uh, the three actors that just about stole the show from me, who are used sparingly, but appropriately, are Judd Hirsch as Gooey. He's a pleasure in everything that he's in. Uh, he plays Howard's uncle or father. There's some kind of relation there that I don't think is ever really specified. Eric Bogosian who I think we are to presume is Howard's brother-in-law or cousin-in-law, no, And I don't think he's supposed to be... This is, this is what's funny here. He's perhaps, aside from Judd Hirsch, the most Jewish man in this film. And I think he's playing Italian or, or Polish or something. You know, they dyed his hair like stark black, greasy black, and he's got a menacing presence in his eyes. He's such a good character actor, Eric Bogosian. Uh, and, but he's an outsider to this family, as Gooey mentions. It feels like somebody is intruding upon your home anytime that he's around. And Arnaud's enforcer is a is a implied Boston guy. Keith Williams Keith Williams Richards. Williams Richards is his last name. Can you imagine that? Williams Richards. That's a real pain. He plays Bogosian's enforcer. And Again, I I I'm, I gotta sing the praises to this guy. He reminds me of every every guy that my aunts and uncles would hang out with back in the early '90s that I can recall. He's so good. There are a lot of strange dynamics that go on between these three characters and Ratner. Ratner seems to owe Arno approximately a hundred thousand dollars, and it's long past due. The relationship between these two characters oddly reminded me a bit of Walter White and his brother-in-law Hank Schrader in the final episodes of Breaking Bad where there is a division in this family that could or should be mended easily if the two men just weren't stubborn or had two different careers but it's not going to be mended easily and the acting party that has to bring violence into the situation does not seem to want to do so but is left feeling like there is no other choice but to in order to get the result that is necessary. And that is maybe absolutely the case with Howard. We're shown aspects of him that make him seem like he's out of his own control in the face of something that, that should be an obvious decision to make. These family elements between Howard and his immediate family and the likes of Gooey and Arnaud are the strongest parts of this movie. It made me want a Jewish Soprano-style series about the Ratners helmed by the Safdie brothers. The only misstep taken in this entire cross-section of the film was the unnecessary and nearly painful cameo by the fat Jew. The memester, remember him? He got in trouble in like 2012 or something. Big fat guy with a beard and a stupid haircut. Kind of reminds me of a overweight Jordan Vogt Roberts. Insufferable man. He did his best to overact even when he was out of focus and the it, it was only vaguely on screen. He had his eyebrows up. He was gaping his mouth like, oh, for, for, for what? He's like, he's not talking at all. He's not even involved in the scene. He's acting overly surprised. It made me sick. So this man is terrible and deserves to be scrubbed from the DVD release. As was the case with Good Time, Daniel Lopatin supplies the score to this film and it really helps construct the tone for what kind of movie this is. It feels like an early 80s thriller, something you'd see like Charles Grodin in. It, it, it's great. Uh, the thing, though, that is strange about Uncut Gems is that it tries to platform John Carpenter elements that don't quite mesh with the film or its subject matter or aesthetic. Uh, from the font choices to the synthetic score, it's like the Safties were trying to echo Carpenter and I can't make sense of why, other than them being fans of his work. There's nothing about this film that coalesces, from what I can recall anyway, with the work of John Carpenter. The cinematography is handled this time around by Darius uh, Kanji. 
who has an illustrious resume and for the most part does a very good job here. It's a better shot film than many others I've seen this year. But he doesn't live up to what Sean Price Williams delivered with Good Time. Now, I understand that I'm comparing the two films a lot, but that's only because there's so much between the two that overlap. Good Time was shot exquisitely well and had fantastic color balance. You know, there are some genuinely ugly shots in this movie. Shots where I almost audibly asked myself how they wound up in the film. For example, when Ratner goes back to his Manhattan apartment, and this is early on in the film where we are really introduced to Julia. He, he goes back to his apartment, he meets with Julia and her friend, and she's got two other friends leaving the apartment. He's clearly upset at her. And we cut to a medium shot on Sandler where all you can see is electric fuzz, as in the ISO on a digital camera was jacked way up. How, how does that happen? There's no other scene that's really, I mean, there's a few scenes where it's clearly excessively grainy or the, the, the main character that's in the shot is out of focus, but it said that this movie was shot on 35mm. I don't buy it. Not exclusively, anyway. So this must have been a coverage shot. You know, what happened that day where all other options were rendered unusable? And this is the shot that had to make it into the film. You couldn't do a pickup day? You know, the movie otherwise is clean. It's a spectacle. One of the better shot films of the year, as I had said before. Fantastic editing, too. But there's hiccups like this where you have to wonder why. Why did you go with that? It, it brings me back to the daddy long legs, uh, heaven knows what style of filmmaking that they haven't uh, completely abandoned. If this was indeed an intentional choice and it wasn't like, ah, oh, fuck, we're, we're kind of screwed. We need a shot of, of Adam in this scene before we have him go to the bed. What do we got? Oh, that's it? You couldn't bring... I mean, it seems like they hang out with him quite often now. You couldn't have him stand in front of a green screen or something and just do that? Jesus. So... As I had alluded to before, Uncut Gems doesn't quite stick its landing, and that is unfortunate. The ending feels rushed. It's like a ruined orgasm. The Safties string you along for a story in this hyper-reality space, and then they conclude it somewhere a bit closer to heaven knows what. You're hit with a hard dose of yeah, this is exactly how this would end in reality, after being goaded through almost two and a half hours of Howard Ratner subjecting hell upon himself and his family through poor impulse control in the most cinematic manner. What delivered a big victory with that basketball game, the Celtics win, he manages to double his bet, even though he's got Arno and his two hired goons locked up in the space, he's trying to prove a point to them, and uh, he gets off. He gets a bullet to the face as soon as he lets them out. So it's an immediate come down where, you know, it, it doesn't allow the movie to feel complete in its ending, which is, which is tragic. You, you have all of this laid out and then you rush through the ending. You, you just, you quickly speed through it, which, you know, maybe, maybe that's the point because his death is so immediate, you know, the, but there's just something about his death and Arnaud's death, because Arnaud winds up getting killed by Phil, Keith, Keith Williams Richards, Williams Richards. He gets killed, and Phil just starts, like, breaking the jewelry cases and stealing all of these fake Rolexes, as if, you know, that's somehow going to compensate for the money that's going to be lost in his now uh, lack of work. So it's, it's frustrating, as far as that goes. It, it, didn't feel, it didn't feel like a proper climax. And it was uneven. That could have been what they're going for. Quentin Tarantino style, when he kills off characters, is it's fast. It's immediate. We have no time to address it. We got to move on to the next thing. Like Django Unchained. You watch a string of main characters get killed within a sequence of maybe about two and a half minutes. And at no point do we stop to go, oh, no, that sucks. So Uncut Gems is one of the most unique films to have been released this year. I was very happy with it. It is a complete turnaround for Adam Sandler's film career if he chooses to do more like it. And we already know film, for the most part, is more of a medium for him to which he can make some money and work with his friends, which I respect. I think he's pretty transparent as far as that goes, remaking the same terrible comedies over and over and over again, just so David Spade and Chris Rock and Rob Schneider can continue to get work. Nick Swartzen. 
And it lives up to its promise of creating a time at the movies where you feel pure anxiety for over two hours. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing. So, to quote Stephen King, it's a great thing, Dr. Sleep. Oh, by the way, Mike Flanagan, director of Dr. Sleep, blocked me, blocked Hans, blocked Jerry, and then came at Jake with five replies, uh, critiquing his analysis of the film and filmmaking in general. Can you imagine that? Mike Flanagan. Now, it's no surprise at this point that celebrities are known to have thin skin, but it's amazing to me that you can get to a certain level in the industry, in the business, having that thin of skin. Like, is it, 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 do, do these executives now just go out of their way to coddle the filmmakers, to not point out the problems? And I mean, clearly, we're seeing a lot of terrible movies get made, and Dr. Sleep is certainly one of them. Not to immediately rush out of Uncut Gems here. Check it out. It'll, it'll probably look as good, if not better, because of those problems I, I stated before. They're not going to be as apparent on... Netflix or on a Blu-ray release, I would assume, on DVD. Uncut Gems, one of my top 10 films of the year. Uh, I, I, I love the Safdie brothers. Can't sing their praises enough. Check it out when you get the chance. But back to this Mike Flanagan deal. What the fuck is that all about? I, I, look, if he had, it, look, if he was known for being sensitive and just had one of those Twitter block algorithm set where it's like anybody who says anything bad, any, anybody who types the words Dr. Sleep, and bad movie gets automatically blocked. That would be one thing. But he saw my reply. He blocked me. He blocked Hans. Poor Hans. I feel the worst for Hans. He didn't he didn't really do anything wrong. He never does anything wrong. He's just he's a he's a good young man. And he gets roped into the wrong crowd from time to time. He's a lot like Ricky in Boys in the Hood. That's how this was. I was more like Ice Cube drinking my 40 on the project steps, and Ricky had his whole career ahead of him and gets axed. He gets offed. He gets 86th just because he put his nose where it didn't belong for a short period of time. And that's how the world is sometimes. Sometimes Mike Flanagan's gunning you down in an alley, and you're, you're running as fast as you can. You've prepped your whole life to be the running back, but you can't outrun a bullet. Anyhow, this has been movies for this week. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. We gotta continue a little bit. I'm gonna be putting out a top 10 movies of the year list, maybe top 12, because 11 and 12 are, are great films as well. I'm gonna be putting out a formal list on lowres.live, which I'm gonna have to change the URL to at some point, because Facebook and Instagram decided, oh, no, 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 this is a harmful website. This dot .live link seems very suspicious. Is this a virus? Is, it, is that a virus you're promoting? Okay, we can't have this website linked here anymore. So even in my profile, where it says official website on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash lowerswb, it, it, it will just bring you to a weird in-between page that goes error, error. So I'm going to have to figure out if I can get or we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, I will be putting out a, a list of the top 10 or 12 films of the year within the next couple of weeks, and I will probably be doing an audio version of that as a podcast, so stay tuned. Thank you all for your support and for listening to the show each week. I, I am very uh, grateful for that, and as 2020 approaches us, I can only hope that this decade breeds more great films. I think the 10s are, are not going to be a, a, a remarkable decade. In retrospect, there's definitely some great movies that were released during this time, but on the whole, this might be the weakest decade for film possibly ever. With 2019 and the trend that movies and cinema seem to be going in, where filmmakers are becoming more adventurous, my prospects for the forthcoming decade have risen. You know, not, not all is lost, but I do think that the, the medium of film is going to have to transform in some way to adapt and stay relevant to this streaming uh, uh, streaming culture where I, I, you know people are, are making jokes on uh, on Twitter. Maybe they weren't really jokes about how to process the Irishman as a miniseries. Here's where you begin. Here's where you stop. That's just a ridiculous notion that the average person doesn't have the palate to sit through three and a half consecutive hours of a movie but they can binge watch three and a half hours 
of YouTube videos, which is about like 20 videos, you know, it's all a matter of perspective. So something has to change in terms of the, the outer shell of film, I think. And maybe that's something to explore, either uh, in an analysis or through, uh, you know, trial and error practice. We shall see. But this has been Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema. I have a couple of more episodes left in 2019 before we wrap up. Thank you again for listening. Yeah, Kevin. Uh, Kevin was was blew our mind every day on set. Watching Garnett. Unfortunately, I used to hate him as a player. Now I watch. I like rewatch your highlights. And be like, oh man, oh that was sick. Yeah. yeah. yeah now, now, now actually, I root against myself. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> but to watch scenes with Kevin opposite Sandler, it was. Um, uh, yeah, I'm excited for you all to, kind of, to see it fresh after after seeing everybody live. It's kind of awesome. So. Yeah, I don't know, enjoy. It's a wild ride. and uh, I like the seats you got, by the way. Everyone's hey, falling. Right. Wake up, right? <laughs> <laughs> you two look like you're falling. All right. <laughs> nice to meet you all. Yeah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we'll see you after, everybody. Right? And, uh, yeah, this movie you guys have seen earlier, this is a, this is a Christmas movie, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>